Good afternoon, everybody. So as the whole of the United Kingdom waits to hear, if we can go on holidays to Pitcairn Island. Welcome to our catch up session of our RSM COVID-19 video. This is where we try and answer a random selection of your questions that were asked but not answered in the previous sessions uh, going back over the last couple of months. Um, and that means I have in front of me about 2000 questions. So fasten your seatbelts, it's gonna be a long night. Now, who's, who's here today to talk about these things? Well, we're all got some, as we do for this session, um, some old lags from the COVID-19 series, three of them, I'm afraid. Susan Mitchie, you're here, thank you. Um, we last had you talking on from home on behavioral science and the pandemic uh, with David Halpern showing off that he was in the garden at number 10. No wedding going on though in the background, I hasten to add. Susan is the director of the UCL Center for Behavior Change and sits on SAGE and Indie SAGE. Robin Chattock, Professor Robin Chattock from um, Imperial. You're the chair of mucosal infection and immunity. Um, and again, very familiar to all of you. We have you um, on our list as we just call you Mr. Vaccine, I'm afraid. And then welcome back, um, without whom our monthly roundup wouldn't be the same, is Professor Peter Oppenshaw, also from Imperial. Uh, we call him for basically just about everything, as indeed does every news channel in existence. Now then, before I put the first of 2000 questions to the panel, it's time uh, to kick off as we do with these sessions with a quick round of, let's see if I can get the theme music up there. I should know it well enough myself now, Desert Island Papers. And uh, for those who didn't see Desert Island Discs, it's available on all good iPlayers. Now, so who's gonna kick off? Susan, do you wanna kick off for us? What's it just to you in the last few weeks? I want to share a commentary by Cam Leshkunsi and colleagues on whether there should be mandatory vaccination for healthcare workers. Um, the reason for addressing this is the healthcare workers take up is much lower than um, the rest of the population. And um, that's for a whole variety of reasons, which includes um, different concerns and beliefs and general distrust and skepticism, uh, but also issues to do with um, access in terms of often it's um, not offered in the hospitals, difficult getting time off, it's not being um, promoted actively. Um, the conclusions of uh, this group who have a lot of um, experience working with healthcare workers and conducting research is um, no, um, it would be discriminatory and it doesn't address the concerns. And instead what they suggest is open dialogue that addresses concerns and shares information about safety, efficacy, et cetera, from trusted, tre credible sources, um, also addressing perception of risk and perception of need. Secondly, offering regularly because hesitancy is going down. So just because people um, didn't take it up at one point doesn't mean they won't now. Thirdly, much more wider community engagement. So um, working through family and friends can um, influence healthcare workers. And finally, uh, supportive workplace policies. So having vaccination on site, really good PPE, so they're reassured about safety, ease of appointments. Some people aren't digitally literate and often the only way of getting these appointments is um, through a digital platform being given time to attend and ensuring that employers and managers are really promoting it. So I thought very sensible and very timely. And in an excellent journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, just to make that clear. But just one quick follow-up there though, that um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission yesterday, I think, um, said that they would have no problems with making it compulsory for care workers. So it's inevitable that that will therefore move into NHS workers. Um, doesn't that change the picture a little? Somewhat surprising view but, from them? I mean, the main argument is um, that it's counterproductive. Um, right. And indeed, other places when um, mandation has been tried, it's actually um, been worse than not doing anything because part of the reason is a lack of trust um, in authority. And so having authorities making some, something mandatory um, can yeah. further alienate. So I think the, the approach outlined in this article is really the one to follow for the, for the moment. Yeah. We can put in the evidence box France, for example, as an example of that. Okay, so Robin, what have you got for us? So <clears throat> my cho chosen paper is a, a paper in Nature Medicine uh, from a few weeks back from uh, the senior authorist Miles Davenport. And it's looking how levels of neutralizing antibodies uh, are predictive of immune protection from right. 
uh, symptomatic infection and severe disease. And it depends on whether you're a glass half full or a half empty person. Um, if you're looking at actually preventing infection, symptomatic infection, it looks as though levels can drop to about 20% of convalescent sera from people who have been recently infected um, before you start to see 50% breakthrough. But for severe disease, it can drop down to 3%. Um, so if you're thinking about an intervention preventing people ending up in hospital, that's probably good news. Um, and protection against severe disease may go out for a period of years, whereas preventing infection, more likely a period of months. And that has very big implications in terms of preventing transmission, preventing import of new variants, um, versus protecting the NHS from being overrun by severe cases. And I'm sure those issues will come up in our further discussions. I would be really surprised if they don't. But I just come just one thing though, when you say it could be protection for years, we don't know that, do we? Because we've only had this for a year and a bit. That's correct, but it's modeling out based on the data that we have so far. So if you extrapolate the data oh, okay. we have, it would be predicted to be protective against severe infection for years. Now that doesn't mean that it's the neutralizing antibodies that are doing the job. It may well be that it's the cellular immunity that's preventing that severe disease. And that may again be very important in terms of protection against variants. Okay. So Peter, are you half full or half empty today? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm um, yeah, I'm, I'm slightly put out because that was exactly the same paper that I was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Just shows so, that we don't collaborate. Okay. That was a double nomination from both me and from Robin. I think <laughs> I find it quite um, refreshing that this Australian group um, actually were prepared to, you know, go in print ranking the different vaccines and clearly saying that, you know, Moderna, Novavax and the Pfizer-BioNTech sort of pull out of, out ahead of the, of the crowd and that some of the vaccines are pretty poorly immunogenic compared to, you know, convalescent um, sera. But maybe I, sh I could go to one of my um, backup uh, Desert Island papers, which is Tell about him. which is about the evolution of, um, of of the virus in in people who are immunocompromised. Um, so this was a paper where they followed. Um, an individual's virus over a period of 152 days. They were, um, it was an immunocompromised individual who was unable to clear the virus. And they were able to show successive mutations, many of which actually have shown up in the, in the natural variants um, that have been isolated around the globe. Um, and I think, you know, what I find interesting about this one is the question that it raises about whether there are, you know, rare individuals in the population, maybe, you know, attending clinics down in North Kent or something, uh, who may be um, the source of some of these variants that, um, that then become um, advantageous and spread through the population. So, you know, I think it's so difficult actually to know where these variants come from, but um, I think, you know, the diversity of humanity and the diversity of treatments that people are receiving um, may, may be a contribution to it. Okay, now that could be the last time we're able to talk about Kent, isn't it? Because uh, one of the things that's happened in the last few days um, is that uh, the, uh, for example, the Indian, the, the Kent variant or English variant as Nicola Sturgeon always calls it, then if you notice, but she does, uh, has now been renamed Alpha, which no doubt will please Boris Johnson as a student of Greek, that Alpha will always be at the top. Um, and the Indian variant is now to be called Delta, which actually I have to say seems a very, very sensible thing for WHO to do. And I hope that, uh, that those labels catch on perhaps faster than the, the uh, Delta variant itself will, but it's a, a good thing to do. So then that's what we're gonna start talking about. We've had, there are dozens of questions around this subject. So it's gonna be a bit of a free for all, but let's try and keep a little bit of, of a structure to this. So the first thing I want to ask, I don't know who wants to pick this or not, it may be uh, Peter or, or Robin, but we obviously hear a lot about uh, what's happening in the UK. Now we have to assume that the Delta variant is 
equally um, becoming at home across the world and, 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 and in particular is becoming at home across Europe. Is that in fact the case? Peter, yeah. the camera's gone yeah. to you, so you can... So, so we, we are very much um, a global hub in terms of travel and communication, which was one of the reasons that it was very difficult to um, follow through on the advice about just how severe the lockdown would need to be and the rather the prevention of travel would need to be in order to stop importation. And I think, you know, it is rather predictable that, that now that the uh, 617.2 variant, the Delta variant is becoming <clears throat> the most frequently um, isolated virus in the UK, um, that it will inevitably spread um, to our to our neighbours and to those with whom we have connecting flights. It's just a matter of how long it's going to take, I think. But surely we're not the only country that has links with uh, Southeast Asia. I mean, I mean, the Kent variant allegedly starts in Kent, but if it came to Britain, it surely has come to other places. Yes, already. That's absolutely right. Yeah, it's, it's we're not the <clears throat> we're not an essential um, trading post for viruses. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they can go via other routes, yeah. Okay, and we know it's in the US, we know it's rapidly in Canada. Any, anywhere else, Robin, where it's uh, clearly on the rampage, as, as they might say? Well, I think the, the other thing that um, is starting to get people exercised is to see whether the, you know, there is a, additional linkage with other variants. Um, and so there have been some reports starting to come out of other parts of Asia where some of these mutations are being shared. And so uh, I think we might get, you know, Delta 1.5 or something at some point. Um, it's, it's still going to be a moving target. And, you know, in the UK, obviously, we're rushing to try and get as many people vaccinated as possible ahead of this strain. Um, in other parts of the world where they're really only starting to get their vaccines um, and starting to roll them out, there's no chance of them being ahead of the, the Delta variant. Um, and so therefore it's, it's definitely gonna be around and continue to grow. All right, so let's get on to the $64,000 question then. Um, plenty of colleagues and perhaps you, the panel as well, have been calling for us to put on the handbrake. Um, and not to press on with further opening in two and a half weeks time. Um, and so I'm gonna ask for your views on that. And indeed, it, it, I've not heard that many people saying that we're in a situation where we should actually be doing a handbrake turn uh, and actually going backwards. Um, but by all means, if that's the view, say that again. So um, let, let's start with you, Robin, then. Um, where are you on, as I say, the question that, that has to be by definition settled very, very quickly. I mean, I think we still need to look very carefully at the data. Um, I, I'm still concerned about having enough people having vaccines in the areas, particularly where we're seeing higher levels of the Delta variant. Um, and so it, we just need to be careful we don't unlock too quickly and, and lose those gains that we've got. And if we are talking about a delay, we're talking about a delay of, of you know, weeks, not months anymore, that could be very significant. Um, so I'm not so sure why everybody is absolutely obsessed by fixing it to a date and not fixing it to the data. And what would the data need to do to reassure you that, um, and I'll ask everyone the same question, that maybe not on June the 21st, but at some not too distant point, um, we would be proceeding in a forwardly direction and not driving backwards. What, well, would you, what, what, what would you want to see? For me, it would be a mixture of two things. Seeing that enough people had, had their vaccines, ideally two shots, particularly in those areas where we're seeing the highest incidence of the Delta virus. And also to see that we're not seeing significant breakthrough infections with individuals that have had two doses of the vaccine and at least two weeks from their second dose. Okay, and uh, and we'll come back to that question as well, actually, on, on, on what about the vaccine vaccine policy. But so I take it then you you are pretty you're making a fairly uncoded thing that we should not proceed at pace in the next, when, you know, according to this 
the date that has been set, uh, not in stone, June the 21st. Do you think we should be delaying for some weeks after that? I think we should be being very cautious about well, I'll um, take that making as a that yes. decision. <laughs> I think I'll say yes, Robin, come on. Okay, uh, Susan. Um, I, I agree. And I think if one's, you know, on the one hand, levels are still low, um, but on the other hand, the minority of the population have had two doses. And we know there's a degree of vaccine escape after the first dose. Um, and in addition to that, um, people's behavior is changing. Uh, people are interacting more across households, across communities. This week is half term week where people are traveling all over the country. So a lot of intermingling of different households. And the concern is in terms of the, the rate of rise. Um, and until that has leveled off, and we, we're not seeing these kind of worrying spikes, then I don't think um, anything else should be lifted compared to what there is at the moment. And the other things that we, you know, we just have to keep thinking about is um, ensuring that there's a, a functioning test, trace and isolate system, which there just isn't at the moment, because that's a cornerstone of pandemic control. And we can, e even if we get away with this now, hopefully we will, but it is a race between the vaccination and variant, um, we still are putting ourselves in danger by opening up, up without a really good system that can jump on the outbreaks that inevitably will happen. Okay, and Peter? Yeah, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I don't know whether, Susan, you'd concede that it, it does seem to be working a bit better in areas where they've, where they've got um, local track and yeah. trace in place. Yeah. Definitely. And that there have been some stories of success, even with this more transmissible um, Delta variant. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's so important to get the vaccination rates up. And you can also argue that we should be vaccinating younger people because they have perhaps more of a role in transmission. You know, with the, with the original strains, um, there seemed to be relatively little evidence that transmission amongst younger people was driving the epidemiology. But now looking at the, the parts of the population from whom virus is being, um, being identified, it's extending down the age range, which I think does you know, justify some, some extension if, if those vaccines are available and that doesn't mean depriving more needy people of the vaccines. Okay, now obviously, my job is to put put to you what an awful lot of people have been putting in the question box over the last few weeks because this has been coming up uh, on to us and the obvious question is that you know this time last year uh, the population pretty much agreed to do what they were told as it were or they decided themselves to do for the very good reason of saving the nhs saving lives and we know that that uh, largely was in the uh, the elderly, almost entirely, in fact, I think under 50, something like two or three percent, isn't it, of, of, the, uh, of the casualties. And now we have 87, 97% of the over 80s double vaccinated, 87% of the over 60s, 72% of the over 50s have been vaccinated with both doses. So that's, it is not the same as it was this time last year or at Christmas. It's a very different environment and therefore our, our risk decisions um, we have a lot more um, room to manoeuvre, uh, one would say, because we pretty much got it as good as we, we could still do a little bit better. But we're not going to get more than 97% of the over 80s, are we? Um, you know, that, that's a success in any possible view of the word success. So again, why are we not um, taking that into account uh, in, in the sense that we can take a few more risks now? I'm not saying that's my view, but it's what it's a lot of people's views, as I'm sure you know. But surely that so, is being taken into account. Um, and if you look at the percentage uptake um, by age, as we're coming to lower and lower ages, the percentage uptake is lower. Yeah. So, so that is a concern. So I completely agree with, um, with with the first speaker that we just need to keep an eye on this. I mean, as as far as I've heard, really, it's the next week or two weeks 
which will provide the data um, to give the confidence that this is not going to run away like it did when we had the alpha variant um, before Christmas. And, you know, I think the other thing is learn from the past, learn, learn from what happened in, in the UK previously and learn from what's happened in the other countries um, when they have managed uh, to contain um, what looks like another wave. Um, so we, we didn't um, act early and decisively enough and ended up with a second wave. If we want to be sure of avoiding a, another wave, which I think is the primary aim, um, then be cautious at this stage until there's more certainty. Let me just push you slightly on that, because if I don't do that, others will. That's fine, but why would we now be worried about another wave in the under 30s? Why should we, I can know why we were worried about it last this time last year, but now why would we be worried about it? Two, two reasons. One is uh, the higher transmission, the more mutations and therefore the higher the likelihood of a variant that could undermine our vaccination. And secondly, uh, the issue of um, long COVID, which is very debil debilitating. So it's not just a question of hospitalization and death, but it's you know many, many months um, of people living in miserable situation and that's a hit for the economy too. Okay, so Robin, yesterday John Bell, who we all know and has been on this uh, program as we call it uh, very effectively, uh, so he, he said and I quote, if we scamper down a rabbit hole every time we see a new variant, we're going to spend an awful long time huddled away. So that was John yesterday, John is also very well aware of exactly the same facts as we all are or or, or, or suppositions as well. Robin, is, is John right? Well, I, I think, first of all, we're, we're not scampering down a rabbit hole. So, you know, that would be true if we had gone back into a very severe lockdown over this variant. What we're really discussing here is we've got, within a space of a few weeks, to be able to see real data whether... The, the variant is really being preventing, you know, the, whether the vaccines that we've rolled out already are preventing uh, an increase, an uptick in hospitalization due to this new variant. And if everything looks good, then yes, we can go forward with, you know, the next wave of, of re releasing the restrictions. But if there's anything there that's going to give us a sense of concern, then maybe we need to hang on a little bit longer. And just because once you've released everything, you can't go back easily, that period of waiting for a little bit more data to have that real confidence, it's not the same issue as, as running down a rabbit hole. It's being, you know, doing the, the right thing, um, being cautious, but cautious with a vision of going in the right direction. Okay, oh, that's very well put. Uh, Peter, do you agree with that? Yeah, that's, I mean, if you, if you have a burning frying pan in the kitchen, you're not going to carry on sitting, sitting it out till, till after dinner to go and put out the fire. Best time to put it out is before it's actually, you know, got into the woodwork. You know, I think there's no, no question that the best way to respond is, is to respond early and that that actually not only nips outbreaks in the bud, but also prevents ongoing you know, economic damage. So it's not a trade-off between one or the other. This is a way of preventing all sorts of harms, not only the uh, long COVID, so-called long COVID um, syndromes, but also if you think of the very large number of people who might become infected, even though the rate of severe disease might be low, that still translates into an awful lot of people with very significant disease, some of whom will end up in hospital or die. You know, even people in their 20s or 30s are being seen in hospital with some of these new variants, um, just because of the very large number of infections that might occur. Although when uh, Chris Hobson, head of NHS providers, did his ring round as he does regularly of all the main trusts, um, he was saying that they definitely are busier. But then he said what was really interesting was that um, apart from there's there was quite a few injuries over the weekend of people, trampoline injuries, apparently. But apart from that, there were two things. One was the increase in mental health cases, particularly in young people that have clearly been building up massively. Um, and we're already completely out of uh, 
beds for uh, eating disorders and, and uh, camps, uh, children, young people. And the other was severe complex cases, but not COVID severe complex cases, who again have been delayed and delayed and delayed and are now in, on many of them in a very parlous condition. And he was saying that that's why we're getting busier at the moment um, of increased admissions and increased workload, less so COVID, which as you say, we're now, we are admitting people who we would not have admitted this time last year. I think that's a fair comment. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Not I think in favor of it. We just we do need you know to wait a little while and see yeah. what happens. But waiting until we see a whole lot of deaths is going to be too late. How do you think we're going to come to this decision? I, I just noticed yesterday that um, the Swiss are holding a referendum on this. Now we've probably had enough of referendums in this country, but nevertheless. It's an interesting way that they are in 10 days time holding a referendum on COVID policy. I'm not sure if this is the exact question they're asking, actually, but let's assume that they are. Do you think that's a, a possibility um, that we would ever, you know, as we move further and further into what is the issue of trade offs and really complicated decisions that are not easily solved, even by the geniuses on SAGE? Um, do you know, I just noticed the Swiss are doing that. I mean, they have a tradition of doing that, but do you think there's time to get more of a mandate if we were to continue with certain policies or change our policies? I just put that out as an interesting thing. Susan, what do you think? I think it's never too late to begin um, engaging with communities on big issues. And in fact, this is something that the behavioral science group within SAGE has been calling for um, mm -hmm. for the best part of a year, um, especially in relation to adherence. So, the more that you engage with communities, um, the more you're likely to get the policy decisions right, especially when um, they depend on um, those communities being able to do whatever's being asked of them. And secondly, um, by the whole process of engaging, um, consulting, listening to a diverse range of communities, one's more likely to come up with more appropriate and effective um, policy, but also those people are more likely to have ownership and therefore more likely to adhere. So I think it's a win-win. It, it just hasn't been done. And I think it's at a, a great loss. Um, and I think that, as I said, it's not too late. The sooner that this can be done on a whole range of issues, um, the better. Okay. I still think it's unlikely we will follow the Swiss example, to be honest with you, but it's just interesting what they're doing. Right then, let's assume for the sake of argument um, that there will be some delay uh, brought in, in in the next few days. Um, what should we be doing in, the, in this time? So first of all, Robin, what is the vaccine strategy then that's best needed to combat um, Delta or indeed variants in general? What, should we, or do we just sit tight and continue what we're doing, or do you think there should be some changes? I think we have to continue what we're doing and try and accelerate getting everybody to have two doses. So, um, you know, now actually the onus is, is not so much on having a delay, a long delay between those doses, um, because we know that really this variant uh, needs both doses for people to be well protected against it. Um, so to do everything that we can to accelerate that. Okay, so you're saying we should now be bringing the, the two doses closer together. That doesn't mean that we were wrong to extend them earlier in the year. Correct. I mean, maybe we were lucky because the Delta variant wasn't there. I think it yeah. would have been a very different case. But, uh, you know, obviously, when we started off, the vaccine was matched against the, the strain that was circulating the predominant strain. So we were in a different place at that stage. OK. And I did notice, I think yesterday's New England Journal, and it's uh, Eric Topol. Well, I know it wasn't his papers. He just put them on Twitter. But there was um, an argument that actually there might be some advantage now to actually mixing. So do one of one or one of the other. Um, and I can't quite remember what the argument was, but I'm sure either you or Peter will, will immediately tell us what the argument is. Um, Peter, do you want to say? So, so there has been, um, <clears throat> been a study um, that, was, <clears throat> that isn't out yet, but which was sort of press released in Spanish, <laughs> showing, showing that if you, if you swap from one vaccine to another in between the first and the second dose, that you actually <clears throat> improve the immune response. And there was, a, there was a letter in the Lancet from 
the very, very nice study that's going on in Oxford where they were, they were swapping around um, vaccines and also increasing um, the interval or decreasing the interval. So really nice balanced symmetrical study design. And I think we're all waiting for the full results from that. But so far, they've reported on some of the side effects, which seem to suggest you get more of a reaction sometimes if you, if you swap around. And that might possibly be accompanied by a better immune response. It makes immunological sense that actually you might uh, get a good response by, by, by... Just briefly, for people like me, just explain what the immunological reasoning might be for that. So if you've got two vaccines and they've got <clears throat> sort of maybe a background or support of one type, but the active bit is the spike protein, and you mm -hmm. first give one, one of the uh, vaccines, then you trigger an immune response to you know, stuff which includes the spike protein. They come back with one <clears throat> which has got the spike protein and some other sort of um, infrastructure, then the immune system recognizes the spike protein advantageously because it's seen it before and so it responds again. So uh, I'm sure Robin can explain this. And also. <laughs> was, was he wrong, Robin? Was that wrong? No, no, he, he was right. I mean, obviously, it is the case where, where the vaccines are very different. So, you know, a viral vector combined with an mRNA vaccine makes sense. Swapping from, you know, the Moderna mRNA to a Pfizer doesn't make much sense. Right, yeah. When you're, when you're mixing the kind of the way the vaccine is being delivered, then the immune system is seen in a slightly different way. You're kind of tricking the immune system to say, oh, you've seen something that's similar, but you've seen it in a different context, and therefore you get an exaggerated response. And the other aspect is that the RNA vaccines are, are really good at boosting the antibody levels. So you maximize the antibody response, but perhaps less of the cellular response. And so that mix and match process may get you into a sweet spot where you've got kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, and that could be important for sustained immunity. Okay, that, that's really clear, thank you. Uh, so Susan, if that's what you know, government should be doing, which is pushing on with the vaccine program but making that tweet that has just been mentioned, what should people be doing now? I think the, the main issue is uh, for people to be um, behaving in a way that minimizes transmission. So we just keep the transmission rates down. And obviously over the last few months, it's become more and more evident um, that aerosol transmission is a really important primary transmission route. And the case for doing as much outdoors is incredibly strong. So now that at last some fine weather has arrived, <laughs> I think a main message is do all your socializing, you know, see people from other households, do it outdoors. If you are indoors and seeing people from other households, make sure windows and doors are open. If you're going to um, shared public spaces, whatever they might be, pubs, restaurants or whatever, choose wisely, go to ones that aren't crowded, go to ones that you can see are well ventilated. So I, if I were the government, I'd just be pushing that message out. And, you know, last year we were incentivized to help out to eat out. Actually, you got a subsidy by eating the food in. If you tried to take the same food out, you didn't get the subsidy. Maybe this year they should just turn it around and you get the subsidy for eating outdoors. That's a good idea. Yeah, well, I hope the Chancellor is listening. I mean, uh, at the moment, that would be a, a delightful idea. That's true. I mean, do you think... But do you, and this is just a general question, partly for you, but part for everyone as well. Now, at the moment, you're saying that people should be encouraged, advised, and, uh, you know, it, it is much nicer eating outdoors now. Obviously, it is. I was doing it last night. Um, do you think we're now moving into, a, as, as, as Chris Whitty said, as we move from, on this program, as I said, from the pandemic to the endemic stage of COVID, that the time for... Uh, Pulling, pulling out, pulling back on, on mandation is now close to with us. Are we at that point now? Well, there's a, a paper coming out from SAGE, and I do hope it comes out sooner rather than later, because it's been um, on the stocks and not been published for a few weeks now, which is all about moving from a, a, a strict rules-based to more of a risk assessment and risk management approach. Um, because yes, it's clear, that people are going to have to manage this in one shape or form for the foreseeable future. And so it's a question of people really being able to assess their own risk, 
um, in terms of their own behavior, their own um, condition and vulnerability, those of other people, but also the settings they're in. Um, so it's, it's quite complex, but actually, if one can give a few um, principles to uh -huh. people, there's absolutely no reason why people can't really begin to assess that risk and learn how to manage the risk. But it does mean that um, it's not just about giving people knowledge and, and skills, it's also about changing the kind of material um, world and infrastructure and also the social infrastructure to support all of that, really embedding it in our everyday environment and in our everyday lives. Okay, I mean, that, that's very, very clearly put us again. And, and actually a lot of people will, will, I'm sure agree with that. Now, so but I, I want to I want you just to stay there for a second because I want to put a specific thing to you about how a kind of change in the kind of advice we're giving and the problems we're doing. And this is how to, we, it seems to me that we have a job now of encouraging people now to do things that we've previously been discouraging them to do. And can we just start with the, there was a nice study out from ONS very recently. And these are the, the this that we, well, apparently the, the abbreviation is CEV, I didn't know that, clinically extremely vulnerable. So these are the people sheltering, self-isolating, and there are in fact three and a half million, 3.7 million uh, of those uh, in the country. And what that showed was, even though the, the rules had been uh, eased, uh, in the last couple of months, half of those people were still completely self-isolating at home and had not left the, their home, even though the advice is now that that is uh, possible. So got, that's a lot of people who are not, for whatever reason, taking advantage of or not wishing to do so. Now, obviously it's their choice, but it can't be a, a good choice forever. So what, what changes in the way that we should be approaching this as we're trying to think that people, look, it is time, you know, it is now possible to do these things, which will help lots of other issues like your mental health and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, I think the first thing is to gather data about the extent to which this is a problem. Because, you know, we've been earlier talking about the fact that um, everybody should still be being very cautious because we're in a very uncertain time. And so one could argue um, that actually that's quite an adaptive uh, behavior for the next couple of weeks until things become clearer, while there's this uh, new variant, while there's um, a degree of vaccine escape. So I think the first thing is, you know, is it a problem? Um, and secondly, um, what's the nature of the problem? You know, is it causing uh, loneliness, mental health issues? Is it getting in the way of people wanting to do the things they want to do? We just don't know. So I think we want to find out what sort of problem is it for how many people? And then what is it that's um, stopping people going out? Until we have that sort of information, it's quite difficult to think about how best to go forward. But a general principle is always um, to kind of support a gradual um, approach for people to do um, a small bit of what they want to do most um, mm -hmm. and see how it feels, see how it goes, and then build gradually on that. So I think, you know, speaking as a clinical psychologist many decades ago, that would be <laughs> the kind of approach to take. Yeah. I mean, it was just anecdotally, it was, it was so easy to get tickets for the cup final, even though it was a 25% audience. It was clear a huge number of football fans who would normally have, you know, um, eaten their grandmother to get there we're not doing that. And so um, it's not the case that everyone is rushing to get back even to and, something. Um, you know, if you think at the, right at the beginning of this pandemic, people were locking down themselves. Yes. The government finally did. And I think people are sensible. People, you know, listen to the news and read and think. And this, you know, is a time to be cautious. So, you know, one could say this is very adaptive, uh, what people are currently doing. I think if this is the case when the situation is very different, um, then we might have a different conversation. But my belief is it won't. I think as the situation becomes safer and more certain, more, more people will begin going out and about. Okay. So um, the other two then, Robin, Peter, do you, do you want to come in on, on that in a, in a general sense? I, I wonder how good people are at estimating their own risk. You know. <laughs> 
I mean, many of us who have worked in the field of infectious disease for a long time, we've, we've you know, been trained in lab safety, you know, we're, we have fairly clear ideas about what's safe and what's not safe. But I, my impression is that if you're not trained in that way, there's a very large spectrum of, um, of personal risk estimation. Um, but I, I mean, I would say I totally support Susan in the idea that trying to transfer a responsibility um, to being more of a personal one would be highly desirable if it, if it can be shown to work. You know, I think the, that if people think that it's somebody else out there who's making them behave in a particular way, that's much less likely to cause appropriate behavior than if actually it's it, you regarded as you versus the virus. I mean, can I just come back on that? Because although the personal responsibility is a part of this, there's also the government responsibility to make settings safer. You know, so managing the risk in terms of workplaces, in terms of public spaces, in terms of schools, um, you know, doing the kind of things of ventilation, of spacing, um, and ensuring that standards have been set, that those standards are monitored, and there's some kind of consequence if the standards aren't kept to. Now, this just hasn't been done all the time along. I think it's one of the biggest weaknesses, along with the test, trace, and isolate system, of the government response. So there does have to be a contract. Yes, people have got responsibility um, to become more skilled and more knowledgeable of how, about how to do this, which I agree does require that. But on the other hand, um, infection control and, and, and risk management um, has to be a partnership with the government doing its bit also. Okay, and Robin, do you want to come in on that? I mean, I think uh, there's not much to add, but I think at some point we'll definitely get into a situation where, you know, human humans break down across the spectrum. And we've we've always had some people who said COVID-19 is not a problem. It's not even a, even a virus at one extreme. We will be left with people who are overly worried. Um, and I've already heard from a number of, you know, personal contacts, people who said, look, I've had two doses of the vaccine, and now I think it's all, you know, I've lost any sense of, of safety because of this new variant. Um, and they're starting to worry that actually the gains that, that they've had from the vaccine are going to be written off, and that's clearly not the case. Mm -hmm. So uh, there will be a, a, a phase, which I hope that we'll be moving to soon, where actually we'll be uh, working with those people that are unnecessarily worried about remaining threats can be reassured. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's going to be a lot more difficult than we think. It's a, it'll, it'll be a lot, it's a lot easier to get people into lockdown than to get them out. I'm sure that uh, Susan would agree that it's not actually a simple, uh, a simple issue. Uh, okay, now let's, um, we had a lot of, we've got, I've been given from Mission Control that we can go on five minutes extra because you're all doing so well, they said to you, that's very charming. Um, let's quickly go back to children and young people, because again, there's a big decision to take and some countries are now doing this. Um, and again, it's another set of different risk judgments, but uh, Robin, I think you were, you were coming around to, the, to saying that we should be now vaccinating or at some stage, uh, 12 to 18 year olds. But, I, don't, I don't think I did say that actually. Didn't you? Oh, okay. No, I, and I think <laughs> I think that's a, that. I think maybe Peter was was alluding to that. Obviously, right. that it's it's a real delicate balance, the risk benefit uh, equation there, because we know that that age group are really very unlikely unless they have some underlying health issue to end up in hospital. Um, and uh, while it may make sense in terms of trying to reduce transmission in coming months, given that prevention of infection is much less easy to ensure for a prolonged period of time, it may only gain uh, a, a reduction in transmission of a period of months rather than uh, for a very long period of time, uh, you know, even up to a year. Mm. So I, I think it's, it's a difficult balance to know. Um, and I think we've just got to focus on getting the 18 plus vaccinated. All right. Um, you know, side effects, again, some of these vaccines, they do certainly have side effects yes. for adults. Um, I think it's, I think we still need a little bit more thought about younger age groups, but okay. they may differ. All right, that's fair, fair, fairly put. Peter? 
I mean, there are studies now appearing of vaccination in, in younger children, um, showing that the vaccination profile is, the, the side effect profile is, is not that different and maybe they sometimes have rather milder um, adverse effects. But it's absolutely got to be a risk benefit analysis. And I think we also have to be aware that if we're, if we're giving vaccines to people within our population who may not actually personally gain much from being vaccinated, and we're still not really sure whether that's going to interrupt transmission to a large extent, it, it's really unethical not to be also sharing um, surplus vaccines with the rest of the world via the COVAX um, system. And that we do absolutely need to address the, um, the over-purchasing that, that we and others have done and to share those vaccines out globally so as to reduce transmission and um, reduce disease amongst those who will definitely benefit a great deal. Okay. I'm pretty sure Susan will be agreeing with that last comment. But what about the first bit, though, about the 12 to 18 year olds? Well, just in terms of the last comment, um, from, from what I've heard, I think the really key thing are the issue about waiving the patent so that um, other countries can um, develop and, and produce this um, without the huge um, cost of the patents. And secondly, um, having a global, global strategy um, for helping that production in other countries. So going way beyond, you know, just sharing a bit of um, surplus stock from those countries who, who've overpurchased. But I think the global vaccine um, crisis really um, should be top of everybody's agenda because, you know, the phrase that nobody's safe until we're all safe couldn't be truer. There's a, there is no, it's limited what any one country can do. I think we're, we're going to be having a whole session on that. Okay, so uh, right. we'll, we'll bring you back for that and get the great Kate Bingham back. If you haven't heard her talk, she was absolutely superb. Um, I want to, I want to end though, because um, it's been um, a week of dominant com Cummings, of course, as we, as he's been uh, scaring the horses uh, in parliament or in the select committee, as you know, and there was just one thing I just wanted to get your, your view, Sue, but others as well. Um, we don't normally uh, look back in this program when we're, 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 that's not for us to do. Um, but Dom, Dominic Cummings has certainly made us look back over our shoulders. Well, he made me make sure he's not hiding behind us, actually. But anyway, but to be more serious, um, there's one thing that he very specifically did. He criticized behavioral scientists, and we have one on the program and there are plenty of others, um, for saying that at the start, um, that the British public wouldn't wear a lockdown or Asian style track and trace. You know, the, you know all that we've been through this several times, the, the very, very tough measures that were taken, um, the, the drones, the locking people up, the wearing tags, uh, using your own direct mobile phone data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he basically clearly felt that we would have done that and that the behavioral scientists were just wrong. So behavioral scientist, Susan, you're the behavioral scientist extraordinaire. Cummings right or not? <laughs> uh, well, um, I had never been in a discussion on our committee um, that uh, was of that nature. So I did go back and check the relevant minutes of uh, SPI B, the Behavioral Science Committee, and also the relevant parts of the SAGE um, minutes. And not only will we never ask that question, and our job is to answer the questions we're asked, <laughs> um, we also uh, never never discussed that or proposed that. And in fact, um, if one looks at those minutes, what it shows is we say very clearly that if the government isn't going to do what has worked in other countries, then they need to really explain that very clearly to the British population. Uh, so we, we were kind of, you know, if anything, saying something really quite different than that. So um, that may not be the only thing that um, Dominic Cummings was wrong on, but he was definitely wrong on that one. Ah, touched a nerve there then, did we? Jolly good, <laughs> excellent. Well, I mean, just, but I mean, what would your view have been? Do you, do you I mean, I know you, you, you've answered correctly, uh, you know, Cummings, but if that had been put to you, what would you have said? Well, I think we can all look back to that and, everybody really was saying, looking at Wuhan and saying, mm -hmm. you know, 
like imagine that all of London um, yeah. locked down. Um, you know, it was beyond anybody's comprehension because we hadn't experienced it, we'd never envisaged it. And um, I think people just thought, I don't think, I don't think people were aware. I think that was a, a, a very general kind of um, concern, well, not concern, but view. But I think what happened was when, um, especially when people were seeing on television, the absolute nightmare in the hospitals in Italy. Mm. Um, then at that point, I think people were saying, look, you know, we've got a choice here. Um, so I think people shifted really quite quickly. Um, so, I mean, certainly uh, by that point, you know, had I been asked, I would have said, um, yes, go for it. And what we've seen all the way along is that even under incredibly challenging circumstances, the majority of the British population have sacrificed a huge amount to adhere to the kind of restrictions that have been um, imposed on us when they know that there is a, a, a real threat and that what they can do can make a difference. And I think that's one of the most heartening things um, of this last year, just seeing the way people do rise to challenges and also right. care and look after each other in the communities. I mean, I think if you weren't gonna make that point, I would have made the point that actually people did did lock down, et cetera, et cetera, uh, without, uh, without the need for excessive coercive measures. I think that's true. I'm going to give you both, all three of you, one last comment, but I need, first of all, just to quickly do a little bit of housekeeping with everybody and just to remind them that um, this time next week in this slot, um, Jenny Harris, uh, previously Deputy CMO, now Chief Executive of the UK Health Security Agency, I think you UGSEC or something, UGSEC or UGSEC we're supposed to call it, I don't know. Um, and also the head of NHS Test and Trace will be here. So please register now and send in your questions right now to Jenny. Um, on Wednesday, so six days time, the, our In Conversation will be with Dame Carol Black. That will be Roger Kirby talking to Carol Black, um, who has led more public inquiries and most of us have had hot dinners, I think and that'll be seven o'clock on Wednesday. And a couple of extra things, the embarrassment of riches isn't quite over. Also next week on Tuesday, our climate change series. Um, and this time, uh, Adrian James will be, he's the chair of uh, RC Psych, the president of RC Psych, um, will be hosting a session on climate change and mental health. And that's a definite good one. And then right for your diary, July the 8th, in place of this, uh, um, this uh, series we're having now, we'll have a much more extended one um, on long COVID. So July the 8th, this lunchtime session will begin at the same time, but will be extended uh, with a galaxy of talent. Um, now, today has always been free, but that one actually, we will be uh, um, asking for, well, you will have to pay something to get, uh, get into that because uh, it's a much more uh, complex and difficult thing to arrange. However, that shouldn't stop you if you're in the money today, uh, still donating to the RSM today. So now back to our guests. So one, one final observation, as we're, we are in a, you know, decisions are gonna to have to be made in the next few days. So a final reflection on um, what things should we be looking out for in the coming days or not looking out for, um, what, what might be an overreaction and what might be an underreaction, something like that. So who, who kicked off last time? It was, uh, uh, anyway, I think it's time to hear from Peter. Yeah, I think we just need to <clears throat> look for early markers of severity and impact and see whether we start to see a rise in hospitalizations and um, in severe disease. I, I think you know, that to me is the thing which we need to look at over the next week or two. I mean, I think longer term, uh, what I think is gonna be so important is how long it takes the virus to stabilize in terms of evolving mutations and you know, how long it's going to be before things we hope become relatively stable if that's what's going to happen. It's, it's a, a, a very, it's, it's going to be yeah, quite a long process now. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by a long process? Well, watching the virus throw up new variants and, um, and us countering with, um, you know, improve, in updating of the, of the vaccines. Okay. Oh, well, yes, that could go on ad infinitum, but that wouldn't be a problem, would it? Yeah, I hope it won't be ad infinitum. That's really the point I was trying to make. Oh, okay, Barry. Hoping that things might, it might run out of options. Okay. Susan? I will be looking out for uh, PHE publishing the data on what's been going on in schools. 
because we do know that the rise in transmission has been steepest in the schools. Um, and we also do know that we haven't got the full data, despite um, many organisations having been asking for it for weeks now. Um, in a situation like this, everybody needs access to all the data to really understand what's happening and therefore take the best decisions. So that's the thing I'm going to okay. do. But we should point out that um, despite, you know, there were a lot of people, very good people, many of them on, on this programme who talked about the fact that when we reopened the schools, there would be a surge, you know, a, a possible wave. That didn't actually happen, did it? So we're, modelling isn't a perfect science. No, but we're talk, what we're talking about is um, real data with this okay. new Delta variant. All right, fair enough. And Robin? I, I think I, I would be looking at severe disease, hospitalisation, yeah. particularly with the Delta variant. Any evidence of breakthrough with people who've had two doses of the vaccine? Remembering, you know, our, our eldest population had the vaccine double dose the furthest time ago. Um, so, you know, we don't know how long the immunity will last as well. Um, and also to remember that we've done incredibly well in the UK with rollout of vaccines, but we can't think of ourselves as Fortress UK. We need to get those vaccines rolled out the rest of the world. Not sure that patents is the only way to make that happen or that whether that's just kind of a flag waving, but that's for the next session. We're going to come back to that. Yeah, we're definitely going to come back to that. So, all right. Now, I think we're also, one of the things about doing this and the way we do it is, when we used to do it live, um, uh, it would have been at the RSM, et cetera. At the end of this, uh, I would thank you all. And then the, the episode or, or the event would stop. We'd all shake hands. I would tell you again how brilliant you all were. We'd make our way to the bar. And then lots and lots of the audience would come around and want uh, autographs from uh, those who become TV personalities and all that kind of stuff. Um, the really good news is I don't think we're far away from actually going back to that when I will be able to thank you in person uh, for doing this because we've got a lot of thanks to give to an awful lot of people who've given of their time uh, for nothing uh, to do these series with us. So uh, once again, though, you have been an absolutely brilliant panel. I knew you would be, but you were and um, it was great and we owe you a dinner and we do hope that we'll be able to do that in person, not, not in the not very distant future. So keep your emails and uh, phones open and uh, we will see you again. So thanks everybody. Thanks to the people in the back room, but also thanks very much for our three wonderful panelists. And now there would be a great round of applause, but all that's gonna happen is the screen is gonna go dark and we'll go back to our drab, boring lives for the rest of the afternoon. Thanks everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.